I'm Ronnie Eldridge. Welcome to Eldridge and Company. When Eva Moskowitz was in the city council, she was a forceful advocate for public education. She chaired the council's committee on education, and although some disagreed with her sometimes, she impressed most of us with her many oversight hearings, probing reports, and strong opinions. Still a strong advocate, she is now the executive director of a new charter school, and I'm anxious to hear how she's doing and exactly, really, what is a charter school? A charter? Hi. Hi. Hello. Welcome. Thanks for having me. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, a charter school is a public school by law. Uh, new York State got its first uh, charter school law in 1998. But a charter school is run more like a private academy, so you're not subject to the 11 volumes of regulations that uh, state impose, the state imposes and the city imposes on a traditional public school. You are also not fully funded. Uh, charter schools only get about 80 to 85 percent of the per pupil allocation, and they generally get no facility money. So you have to raise private funds just to be on a level playing field. Why do we want charter schools? Well, I think we want them because um, our educational system, by and large, not to say there aren't shining examples of success, is not producing the results that we need to. And one of the reasons, it seems to me, is the overregulation. Charter schools give you the freedom to educate excellently. It still takes uh, instructional leadership. It still takes um, a fabulously trained uh, faculty and dedicated faculty and all of the regular ingredients, parental involvement, and so forth. But at Harlem Success, we were able to hire faculty um, based on merit. And we're also able, frankly, to fire faculty if we do not feel they're performing. You can't do that in the traditional public school system. So people support charter schools. I think some people confuse charter schools with the schools that were set up in the South you know, when desegregation came by private groups as alternatives to schools, and they think that they're uh, more ideological or religious based, but they're not. There's not you can't do that, can no, you? No, certainly not in New York. Yeah. I can't speak for other states, but 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 charter schools are often confused also with vouchers, which they're right. not. They're not. Vouchers. Um, they're public schools, and they're subject to some regulation. It's not as if you have a free hand. Um, in other states, they're more uneven in quality. I can really only speak to New York yeah. City because that's what I know. There are 47 charter schools in New York City, and I would say that the vast majority of those are outperforming their traditional public school. And remember, admission is blind. So unlike a magnet school, or unlike the schools I represented on the Upper East Side, which were selective based on real estate, in essence, yeah. this is blind admission. So. Are there, are there schools outside of New York City that are charter schools? Yes. Yeah. So, um, New York State has reached the cap because uh -huh. politicians artificially put a cap on the number that could exist, and so there's a whole policy debate going on now. Um, I strongly support lifting the cap, but right now the limit is 100, even though parental demand is skyrocketing. Okay. Um, and there are, we've reached that limit. There are currently 100 statewide, 47 oh, right? of which are in, in New, New York. York City. So some people see charter schools as a way of competing with the other public schools in the hopes of changing those public schools. Is that basically what you're saying? Well, I think um, charter operators have different motivations. I think in the first wave of charters, what most operators were simply trying to do is provide an excellent alternative. In my own case, we want to not only educate the kids very, very well at Harlem Success, but we also want to be the FedEx to the U.S. Postal System. We want to um, ensure that our presence spurs the traditional public school to do better. That's what I was going to say. It's more or less like an incubator. I mean, or you're seeing it as an incubator of small new businesses that you want to develop into larger ones that you'd really like to see the results of the charter school show people that if the board of the Department of Education in New York City were to change uh, some of the educational problems, or most of them might eventually long term disappear. Yes, I mean that that's that's <laughs> the goal. I Is mean, that because you're very political in nature that you see things that way and you want to affect the policy? I mean that's not necessarily the case with a charter school 
movement. Isn't right. It? No, no. Yeah. I mean, most operators, and when I say operators, these are not for profit. Most, but some of them are for profit. There are a few, yeah. but very few. And and it's the management company. There's right. a for profit. There are a handful in New York City, but most of them are not for profit. Right. These are people who Literally. love children who yeah. are in this for the. You know, right. very uh, non-monetary reasons. Are they the, sort of the same people who go into the new, innovative, smaller schools? Sure, there there are parallels. I mean, yeah. I, I think some people um, decide to work outside the system, whereas some people decide to reform from within. That same dynamic exists. But I'm not sure that all um, charter school founders have the broader interest in educational reform. For myself, if I were um, simply to create a great school, um, and that's no small feat, so I yeah. appreciate how difficult that is. To me, that wouldn't be sufficiently, um, you know, wouldn't make a sufficient dent. We have 1.1 million children, many of whom are being miseducated. We've got to find a way to have a lever to impact many more children. So I part of my attraction or my interest in the charter school movement is to really crack the replication nut. So I'm trying to do 30 or 40 charter schools over the next 10 or 15 years with the hope that um, if you concentrated them in certain neighborhoods, you could not only educate those kids who went to the schools well, but you could also have this effect on, on the, the traditional community. public school and okay. vice versa. I mean, my goal, I would want them to influence me as well. Mm -hmm. And I go to public schools all over the city to identify best practices, to mm -hmm. find out who has figured out a great way to teach whatever it is. Now, there's some kind of built-in uh, procedure for accountability. Isn't there of the progress? I mean, yes. I mean, there is. Is it different from the Department of Education? I mean, there there is. Um, you know, the state regulates us um, just the way the state regulates traditional public schools, and there's some. Department of Ed accountability, but I would say, frankly, that that is nothing compared to the accountability um, measures we have imposed upon ourselves, mm. whether it's financial or instructional. We assess kids every eight weeks. That's not required by the State Department of Education. We want to know in real time which kids may be falling through the cracks. We also want to know of the 10% of the kids who are at the top of the academic spectrum, are we moving them up? At a traditional public school, I would say that the bulk of the instructional energy goes to the bottom quartile. And of course, they need assistance. But that leaves three quarters of the students without being in the school's mind's eye. And we really make an emphasis, wherever the kid is at, we want them to move 1.5 years of progress. And we tell our teachers, that's the expectation. that. And we test them when they come in. And we also do portfolio work. So we look at their writing when they come in, and we look at their writing eight weeks later. And any kid who is not making what we believe to be 1.5 years, now in writing it's a little more subjective than a, right. you know, a phonemic awareness test. When you talk about assessment, is it is it a te so it includes looking at the portfolio of the writing, looking at what? Well, we have what do you both. mean by assessment? We have quantitative, which are designed where in kindergarten or first grade, it's really testing whether the kid knows ch, sh, the letter sounds ba, can they blend words. Um, fluency is tested, which is not comprehension, it's literally can they read the words on the page and how fast can they read them. Then there's comprehension. Uh, which is another yeah. component of it. In literacy, we have about 20 different skills that are, are tested every eight weeks, and we have meetings with our faculty where we look at the kids in a particular class, and we say, okay, this kid hasn't made 1.5 uh, progress. They're not on schedule to meet the progress. What are we gonna do? And our attitude at Harlem Success is we will do whatever it takes. If that means that the child and the teacher has to come in a half an hour early, so be it. Um, we will schedule whatever need. We already have a long school day, but we will do whatever is necessary to make sure that our children succeed. We hear a lot about No Child Left Behind and what that means. What does that mean, actually? Is that a yearly assessment by a test? Well, it's very complicated, <laughs> and I think there are sort of half a dozen people in the nation who know really exactly understand. what but it means. But on a very broad scale, um, schools 
need to make um, improvements. Certain improvements. Yeah. Certain improvements. And it also, um, and one of the least talked about aspects of No Child Left Behind, which I think are positive, is that it requires you to disaggregate the data by race, by gender, and by special education. And we have really overlooked a real problem where a school as a whole can be doing fairly well, yeah. but then you break it down uh, yeah. by race or gender, and what you see in the case of gender, for example, the boys are not doing as well. Right. And you've got a problem there that needs to be addressed. Certainly with special ed, that's been a yeah. population that so, has not been... The parents and people complain about the stress of the testing. So when you go back to your assessment that you're doing every eight weeks, mm -hmm. it, that's not necessarily in the same vein, that kind of test that makes a kid nervous. Well, well I you think have young children right now. We have young children, and, yeah. and look. Um, when you get your school up to fifth and sixth grade, what will it be? In terms you know, of, of, of assessment or testing? We will assess up the wazoo. Yeah. And so our have attitude, so many tests that it doesn't mean right. something. I mean, our, our attitude is that one of the reasons testing is stressful is because it isn't part of the normal course, right. but also the consequences of not so doing dire. well are so dire, and the kid isn't caught at the beginning. Right, so it we becomes will, the kid's fault. They become punished absolutely. Right, rather that than the is, faculty. Absolutely. That is my personal problem with the right. testing, is that it, it doesn't change the school system. Right. It doesn't change the school. It, the kid is held responsible. And you can't tell me in the third grade that a nine-year-old is responsible for their poor performance. Right. It doesn't, I mean, in high school, one could make that argument that the child isn't doing their homework. But a nine-year-old, if they're reading at a, at a level one, they were miseducated. Right. And it's the adult's responsibility, but the kid get bl gets blamed. So what is wrong with the public, the, the Department of Education or the old Board of Education? What is wrong with it? What are the regulations that are so onerous? You have to abide by the same health department standards, right? Correct. Fire or whatever it Correct. is. Correct. Right. So what becomes the, the, I mean, how how much of the regulations don't you have to abide by? Well, I mean, to answer your first question, which is, you know, what's the problem, which yeah. is sort of a common topic. Right. It's hard to understand, particularly for a generation of people where the public schools used to work. Right. How is it that we've ended up where we are? And I would argue that it's a combination of management and labor. I'm sort of an equal opportunity. I mean, management um, screws up royally all the time. They decide on some cockamamie policy, um, and they decide that everybody should do it because they have a sort of one-size-fits-all. They implement it poorly. And so that's a tremendous problem. Is that the same with the Department of Education and the old Board of Education? I mean. Yeah, they're the Keystone cops so. often. I mean, yeah. that's not to take away from Mayor Bloomberg and Chancellor Klein's um, value added, because I think that they have made some positive contributions. But the bureaucracy I was as, say, it's is, on top as, of this enormous bureaucracy. is as is incompetent as it <coughs> always was. And, um, you know, it's sort of, if it weren't painful, it would be amusing. Um, but also labor has made it very, very difficult to change the system. And I say that as someone, my grandmother was a UFT delegate. I fully support labor when it comes to wages and benefits. Where I draw the line is on work rules. To me, teachers are professionals and need to be treated not like assembly line workers, but as professionals. And professionals don't clock in and out. They work until the job is done. They, of course, need to be compensated for that kind of ethos. That's right. the meaning of professionalism. Right. And what has happened in New York City is instead of adequately compensating teachers, the city tried to save itself money and the labor unions agreed. And slowly but surely, you have all these silly work rules that really get in the way of educating children. But the UFT has always, in my lifetime, been a very powerful uh, force in the city with okay. policy. and. Um, it dictates many things, doesn't it, it? Absolutely. I mean, here's one policy that is absolutely critical to us. Our teachers eat lunch with our kids. Why do they eat lunch with our kids? We will not have a disorderly, chaotic, potentially violent lunchroom. We will not have that. If you've ever been a teacher, and I have, when the kids come up from lunch, it takes you 30 minutes to calm them down 
from that chaotic experience. And for kids who are vulnerable to teasing, it can be quite traumatic, the lunchroom experience. Um, you know, until very recently, teachers were prohibited from being, being in, in the, the lunchroom. lunchroom. And, you know, we have an attitude at our school that whatever it takes to get the job done, we will all collectively do management, labor, because children are what we're all about. And I think that somewhere along the way, um, the unions and management, because it takes two to tango, took a wrong turn. And instead of having collectively bargaining over wages and benefits, which is entirely appropriate, they're, Bargaining they over bargain workers. over how to educate kids, and I don't think that's appropriate. So when you were in the city council chairing the education committee, you had some probing hearings. I did. <laughs> <laughs> what was the most controversial? The most controversial was the five days of hearings I held on the custodians union contract, the principals union contract, and the teachers union contract. And as a result? <laughs> and as a result, um, the teachers union, uh, which is the most powerful of the three unions, vowed to punish me, and they did. I ran for higher office, and they spent you know, half a million dollars against me. Um, you know, vicious ads vicious, that right. were completely untrue. Um, I, I'll never forget my my son campaigned. In fact, it was where I met you at oh, the movie theater right. on 68th uh, and Broadway. I was campaigning. It was the only day my son was out because I didn't want to require him. Or he, he, how old was he? He was six at the time. And uh, you were famous for having campaigned pregnant with an infant. I, I did. <laughs> and all now you've got three of them. I have three. <laughs> Right. There's nothing like uh, motherhood to make one passionate about uh, education. But uh, my son was uh, campaigning, and uh, he handed a flyer, and the person said, I would never vote for your mother. <laughs> and my son looked at him and said, well, why? And the person said, I'm a teacher. And oh. I just sort of thought, what a know, stupid teacher that is. <laughs> to say that, I mean, that's, that's terrible. Of, yeah. We've got people in the profession who don't really love kids. And I guess it's a job. And while I understand earning income is important, you need to love kids if you're going to be in the classroom. But definitely. But you're also still having trouble, even now with your charter school. I read in the paper weeks ago that the school you had planned, and, and you evidently we're, res we're responsible for encouraging charter schools to be located in public school buildings. Correct, correct. I, I identified um, the fact that there were underutilized seats, and in this era of terrible overcrowding, it seemed to me that rather than go empty, we should find a way to use them, whether it's traditional public schools or charter schools. Charter schools are particularly well suited because they tend to grow. In other words, mm. they start small and they get mm. bigger. And most of the available seats, it's not like there's a whole school building right. empty. Right. There are maybe 300 seats empty. And so it can be a starter home, as it were. So I encouraged that policy. The very first school that uh, Mayor Bloomberg and Joel Klein announced was the District 5 school that my brother used to go to, PS 125 on 123rd in Amsterdam. Um, so it was very exciting to see that policy announced. But in practice, it's been incredibly difficult to implement. Again, a combination of missteps by management and labor. The way the schools are cited gets people very upset because it tends to happen in the middle of the night. And uh, not all the parties are notified. There's a story in the paper about school on the Lower East Side where mm -hmm. the Ross School wants to go into a public school. And it's created all kinds of havoc and anger and dissension. But you're still feeling the brunt of this power of the union. Yes, they got us moved. They didn't like us where we were. And uh, even though many families, you know, literally 155 families had chosen us based on the quality of education we um, hope to provide, as well as the location. And for elementary school parents, location is very important. Um, only to find out last week that the UFT um, didn't want us there and had been organizing protests, then they moved us. I would have been happy to go to the first location. I had nothing to do with choosing so who gave it? the Department of so Education. So when does your school start? Well, the kids come August 21st, and so we are in a mad rush to get the building ready for faculty and so kids. So how, how do you feel coming out of, how many years were you in the city council? Six years. Six years, and um, 
three races or four? You, you, you well, ran the first time and you lost on the east side for the city council. Correct. Then you won the second in time. In 99. Then you ran for re-election. Oh, one. Uncontested. No, I had a primary. A primary. And then you ran for borough president. Then I ran in 03 because I was under that quirky right. census. Census thing with the two years. And right. then you ran. for. I gave out my seat. Yes. I wasn't term limited, right. even though everybody thinks I was. I right. wasn't term limited. I decided to take a risk, and I, run, I ran for borough president and lost. In a very bruising fight. Very. Very bruising, yes. Um, with the Working Families Party, which I think was, I mean, I, um, I thought it was a disgrace what they also did. But anyway, so you ran with organized labor more or less against you. Did Correct. you have any labor support? No. Nope. No. So how as a, a as And a I didn't have elected official support right. either. Everybody flew well, that into I the... Think, yeah, right. <laughs> That's always a, a sign for me to go the other way. But anyway, um, uh, how do you feel being a political being um, just generally about politics? I mean, every politicians take positions because it's expedient for the support in their next election, it seems to me. Well, with the union demonstrating its ability to defeat somebody like you because you've taken a strong principled stand. Whether they agree with it or not, they should at least respect it. And they don't respect it, right? Uh, what do you think about politics? And, and the kind of people we're going to... I mean, what's happened to our political system? Well, it would be easy to be very discouraged. And I suppose on my bad days, um, I am. Um, but... I also think that um, it's too important. I mean, it's not, we don't really have many options. We can't sort of, it, it's going to exist whether good people are in there um, uh, fighting for substantive policies they believe. And so it's something where we really need talented, dedicated people to run, and we need them to stay. And, and we to need be supported by other intelligent, smart People you know, who can see what the issues are, don't you Yes, think? I mean, we do. And, and, so, and to me, there aren't any other options. Um, so I still believe that I was, you know, I was able to make a contribution, so I don't have any regrets about my six years um, there. I feel very lucky to have been able to. I held 125 education hearings. I feel like I worked my heart out trying to hold the Department of Education accountable. What were some of the major hearings and well, what you one, saw as some of the major problems. I mean, one of the hearings I'm most proud of, I was the first person to ever hold a hearing on science education in the New York City school system. And we don't teach science by and large until middle school. And how we expect to keep up with mm. you know, the nation and the world if our kids are not educated in science, I don't know. Um, I also held, um, I went through every instructional topic, arts education, civics education, social studies, science, math, literacy, and I also alternated those with the operational topics. So I did procurement. I asked, how is it possible that New York City spends more than I can find on the market items ranging from basketballs to whiteboards? How, how does that work? I held a hearing, as you know, on toilet paper. Why, why is there an insufficient amount of toilet paper? I held a hearing on copy paper because teachers were being <coughs> rationed With copy paper. They have to have three levels of sign-off in order to copy something. The copy machines are constantly breaking down. So when you had these hearings, who came? Well, everyone from the mayor came to my first hearing on mayoral control. Um, the chancellor came a number of times. Um, uh, but, you know, the head of food services came when I was holding a hearing on obesity and the food we're providing. Okay. Did um, the unions come at the time when you were doing the contracts? They did. They did. Um, they did. Uh, yeah, they came. Yeah. I mean, it was not, um, you know, Randy came with Brian McLaughlin sitting next to her and when, without announcing that he was showing up. He's, he wasn't invited. He's not the, that he's I minded. the union leader who's the head of the uh, Central, Labor. Central Labor Council. Right. And she's one of the members of her union. Right. Right. So do you think you brought any changes to the education, the field of education, while you were doing these hearings? Um, I... You know, not as much change as, as I would like, um, yeah. depending on the issue. Um, you know, I feel like I would move the needle 10% when it was uh, an issue like copy paper or, um, you know, but it, 
it's not enough. And given the urgency, you know, one of the most profound hearings I thought I held, I couldn't get anyone to cover, the New York Times, no one. It was on the disparity um, by race and ethnicity of regents' diplomas versus local diploma. Mm. And I was the first person to go through and count up, okay, are whites, blacks, Latinos, Asians, who's getting the college preparatory diploma? And I found out that nine out of 10 black and Latino uh, high school students were getting the local diploma, which is really not this worth a right. hell of a lot. Right. Um, and I couldn't get anyone interested in an issue like that, even though it was clearly new data that no one before had been able to kind of collect. Yeah. So it, there were moments that were discouraging. It seems to me, though, that you've charted a course for yourself that's very interesting and very much to the point and long range is going to be very instrumental in also having an impact on public education. I mean, I'm just not one to give up. So I wasn't able to continue educational policy in the arena of politics right. or public policy. Did it take you a long time to decide this is what you were going to do? Um, well, I initially thought of something that maybe, um, you know, there were things that seemed more glamorous in a way, um, but ultimately I decided that I really didn't, that was not my interest. I wanted to do the thing that I could most materially affect Fetch children. Something. And it seemed to me that these other options were too distant from the end goal, which is helping kids. Well, I th thank you. We're at the end of this half hour, and I hope you'll come back and tell us how you're doing. Of course. Be thank happy you very to. much, Eva Moskowitz.